of the fact that slavery is absolutely necessary to have, provide these products and to uh, provide them to you at low cost and you're willing to buy it, you don't care where it came from. And so that, my, my second argument here is that logistics justifies slavery. It's okay. I don't, I don't, I don't see it. It doesn't bother me. Um, you remember the next thing we came across at the introduction of Wilbur, Wilber, Will, William Wilberforce's story was that by the 1600s, England, London, was self-destructing. You remember, it was with the, with the invention of a little drink called gin, which was short for Geneva, by the way. And gin was cheap and ready-made, and it was, and everybody was drinking. To forget your worries, to uh, relax, to, to go to sleep, everybody was drinking to the point where London was self-destructing as a civilization. And that reminds me, you know, of, of how the, our own government today is very aggressive, it seems to me, in legalizing this and approving of that. And we live in a drug uh, society. Uh, you know, we're, we're all worried about fentanyl crossing the border. Well, why are we worried about fentanyl crossing the border? Because people take it. And they take it knowing they take it. And it's only the few who actually die from it. But we, we, we are such an addicted society today that I think we're very close to what's going on there. And, and, that, and it was so extremely popular to the point where, where all of England was inebriated. And that was the world, you remember, that William Wilberforce was born into. And then we talked about, uh, we talked about the... Uh, the review of, of history from a philosophical standpoint, while all of this is going on in the background, you've got these philosophers, these empiricists, and these rationalists, and they're all trying to reinvent the wheel in terms of what reality is, you know, and, and they're saying, you know, well, this is, this, is, this is how I see it, and you, this is how I see it, and the whole thrust of those philosophers was we, reinventing reality without God. We don't need God. Let's, get, let's find out who we are. Let's discover our world. Let's take charge of our world without God. And so that's called today the Enlightenment. That's what it means. We come up with a philosophy of a worldview that doesn't need God. And so we go on from there. And that's considered an advance in our thinking and an advance in our ability to, to handle things. Then, of course, that invades the, the church and theology. And so now, in order to stay up, in order to stay popular, uh, we, we have to modify our theology to fit all of these philosophies that are coming along. And so you had liberal theology as being very popular. You had deism, which was, well, we don't need Christ. You know, the whole business about salvation is uncomfortable depravity, the sin is uncomfortable. Uh, now that we figure out who we are and who reality is, uh, we need to go forward with a Christianity that is palatable to everyone. And so the result of liberal theology of the day was a rejectionist of the Calvinist view of the Bible. Total depravity, our desperate need for Christ, salvation only in the work of Jesus. And all of that, of course, is set aside. And you remember that the next thing that brought on was the sleepy church of England. So now the church doesn't have any gospel to preach. Now it's all about, you know, just the priests maintaining their own income. You know, they're all about, you know, just what I can get paid for. And so the, uh, the people are, are, uh, are lazy and they're not, uh, they're, they're, they, they're, they're not told that they, they have a need for salvation. Uh, you know, it's, it, everybody's just fine. <coughs> Civility kind of replaces uh, a, a true Christian ethic. And uh, the gospel was virtually absent. Pastors are aspired, you know, they, 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 they just simply are in it for the money and, and they, want, uh, they want a nice, uh, comfortable environment. And you remember that that was the atmosphere in which Methodism arose. 
You remember that? Charles Wesley and his brother John started meeting with others and they began uh, challenging one another spiritually and they began encouraging one another to grow and to truly have a relationship with Christ and everything began to develop. Uh, George Whitfield became a member of that club and eventually they all came over to the United States and they toured the United States preaching the gospel and people got, began to respond to it and, uh, and answer and it became the rise of a new term called evangelicalism. Evangelicalism is a belief in God and a relationship in Jesus Christ, but I don't need the church. Evangelicalism was outside the church. The church was sleepy. It was, you know, remember that the stereotype is a bad one. Uh, we, you know, the, the church is, is all protective of itself and, and doesn't like all this open air preaching. You know, that's why, that's why Whitfield and the others preached in the fields and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, to open air preaching was because the church ministers wouldn't let them in the churches. And so, and so we don't need the church. And that caught on. And so evangelicalism became uh, a great uh, new rise of faith and everything. That, uh, but Methodism, of course, was torn. You had, uh, you know, had John and, and Charles Wesley. They were Arminian. They, they, didn't, they also didn't, didn't appreciate this business of, of, um, uh, of Calvin. But then you had George Whitfield, and he was Calvinist. And he realized that the, the basis of this was total. You had to start with Christ. And anything, anything less than that meant, you know, you could earn your own salvation, pull yourself up by your own spiritual bootstraps. He would have none of it. And so it even split Methodism uh, in those days. But now we start with this year. <laughs> now we start with our prep approach to the Civil War. But we don't start in America. I'm going to give you an angle to this, which took me some convincing before I was persuaded to talk to you about this. I had to read this, this book over and over and over and over again before I was absolutely said, okay, this needs to be shared. Now, what happened in Scotland during this period of time, um, especially with regard to the idea of slavery, is, is, is just now coming to the surface. Uh, only now can you find YouTube lectures that will talk about slavery and how it was regarded in Scotland and, uh, and all of the things. And now you hear about reparations in Scotland and you hear you know, guys condemning the church in Scotland because they were pro-slavery and yada, yada, yada. Um, you, be very careful what you listen to in that regard. Because what I'm going to show you tonight is, well, impressive, if not stunning. And it's, it's too easy for me to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If the United States had followed Scotland, we would never have had a war. All right, now with that set up, let me just go into this. Does anybody know anything about the, the Darien Gap? The Darien Gap is a, is, a, is a little piece of land between Central and South America. It's just north of Panama. Panama is right there. The modern Panama Canal was cut right here. But this is the Darien Gap. And it was not owned or claimed by anyone. It was open territory. But there was a reason. It's, it has to be the worst place in the world, literally. It's, it's hot, it's humid, it's overgrown, it's got diseases, it's got snakes, it's got malaria, it's everything you, want, you can think of, it is in Darien. So much so that even today there is no road through Darien. Nobody can do it. However, the, Scotland, uh, the, the Scots uh, in, back, back home decided that they were going to start a, 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 a venture to cut a canal between, uh, a, a, in this gap, in the Darien Gap, 
and make some money. It's on paper, it sounded wonderful. And, after, and so they launched this program and all of, this, all of the nation of Scotland poured the money into it to get this going and it died a bitter, horrible death. It never got off the ground. What that meant was that Scotland crashed economically and Scotland was forced into doing, the, the, the enterprises, the, the entrepreneurs in Scotland were forced to do anything they could find to make money. And in those days, the place to make money was the slave trade. So Scotland jumped into the slave trade, whole hog, both feet, and got involved with it very, uh, very uh, eagerly. Uh, and meanwhile, what's going on is, is um, in 1701, there is an act of union. If you know Scotland and, Hit and England, they're like, they're like sisters that argue back and forth all the time through history. And in 1701, they decided they were going to they were going to be together. They're, okay, we're going to be one nation. And then in 1999, they decided, oh, we're, we're going to split again. Um, you know, they're, they're just two sisters that keep fighting each other. And, uh, but in 1701, they decided that they're going to be part of Great Britain. And the, uh, the Scottish entrepreneurs threw their lot in to, to the slave trade. Uh, Glasgow built its wealth on those commodities, tobacco, sugar, cotton. Slave ships left the shores of Glasgow and Edinburgh and a, a few ale, uh, sailed from Montrose and smaller ports. They just got into it whole hog because, like I said, the money was in the slave trade. So they're into it. Scotland is knee-deep into slavery. Uh, and they were just, they were heavily invested. Um, you might have heard of the poet Robert Burns. Robert Burns actually wrote a couple of very famous poems about slavery. Uh, one is The Slave's Lament, and the other is A Man's a Man for All That. You ever heard of that one? Look these up. These are interesting poems. Robert Burns, of course, he was, he was, a, he, you know, he was, one, of the, he was one of the celebrities in Scotland. And he was all set to invest in slavery as well until his poems began to sell. And so he backed out of the idea. He said, okay, I'm, I'm doing okay. I don't need to go anywhere with this. And so he was just fine. Uh, he made him economically solvent. Now, do you remember John Witherspoon? He was the Scotland, he was a Scottish minister who came over to the United States, to the, to the colonies. He, he headed up Princeton. He was the sign, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Remember him? In 1745, he takes his first call to Beath Parish for the Church of Scotland, and he remember he stands out as a staunch Presbyterian conservative. You remember the Scottish Church is kind of milk toast. It's 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 uh, you know, remember the, the stereotype that we painted, uh, and he was he was antagonistic to that. Uh, you remember that uh, that when he was on his second call to a church in Scotland in 1758, while he was there, you remember he wrote a very satirical book to mock these guys and really angered them, uh, if, you, if you remember from last year. Anyway, it's John Witherspoon. Okay, I, went, I got it back up. Uh, yeah, this just paints the picture of the theological moderation going on. All of the stuff that you read about in history books is, is going on, but, but basically the, the theological mind of, of the day is very um, simple. And, and they're not interested in things getting any farther along. And that's what is frustrating and angering uh, John Witherspoon. This is a family tree of the Scottish Presbyterians. The American Presbyterians kind of look the same way. I'm not going to go into this, but I'm going to show you. There were fights. There were fist fights in the Presbyterians. And there were lots of anger. You'll notice, however, that there were also reunifications from time to time. All of these divisions have nothing to do with what we're going to be talking about. I'm just, I'm just trying to give you an idea of the background. And this is the section that we're actually in, the 1700s to early 1800s. So you can take that for what it's worth, but we're not going to be talking about any of that. Because for those that were believers and, and Presbyterians to the core, the Westminster Confession of Faith was still the standard that they held on to and claimed. You remember that when the Westminster Confession was written in 
1643, it was, it was Parliament who had sanctioned it, who had ordered for this group of Westminster divines to write, to come up with a church in England's definition, that they trashed it, they threw it out. It wasn't suited to them, but Scotland embraced it. And ever since, Scotland was thoroughly Presbyterian. So much so that even the government of Scotland and the Church of Scotland were merged together. This was the Church of the Nation. And the Westminster Confession was the definition of Presbyterianism. Now, in 1756, while he was still serving in beef in Scotland, John Witherspoon came across something he'd never, dealt, he'd never faced before. He faced a a slave, first of all, even though Scotland was heavily invested now in the slave trade, there weren't that many slaves in Scotland. You remember logistics? This is something that we deal with out there so we don't have to look at it. And that makes it comfortable for us. But there were a few, there were probably only a hundred or so by this time in Scotland. And one of these slaves came to Witherspoon. And his name was Jamie Montgomery. And he said, I have become a Christian. Will you baptize me? Oh, this is, this is new. This is, what am I going to do with this? Well, Witherspoon was not sure how to handle this. And so he, uh, he broke with tradition and interceded for the slave directly, not dealing with the master. Dealt with the slave directly, and he baptized him. And in his mind, Witherspoon is rationalizing, well, this changes his spiritual state, his spiritual condition. It doesn't change his physical condition. That was his rationale. That was how he, he, he made that conclusion. Now, that ra reasoning, even though it was half-baked, even though it was not thoroughly thought out, that becomes one of the most influential decisions in the history going forward. Is it spiritual or is it physical or is it both? Now, Witherspoon himself, just to show you that he didn't really think this through very much, will go on to go to America and he lands in 1768 and he goes to, goes to America and he sees the commodities market booming in the, United, in the, in the North and he says, this is good. This, this, this is good for financial reasons. I, we, can make, we can raise money, we can support the school, all this kind of stuff. And so even Witherspoon decides to own slave himself. And main, he maintains, but, he, but when he does, he kind of appeases his guilty conscience by saying, okay, I'm going to have a slave or two, but I'm going to be teaching them Bible, and I'm going to be at, you know, pleading with them for conversion, and if they become a Christian, I'm going to, I'm going to baptize them. And so he continues to, uh, to, gener to, to deal with slaves on this level. Now, John Witherspoon would go on to teach very famously in Princeton classes on moral philosophy. It was one of the earliest ones in a Protestant perspective. And, uh, but his, his moral philosophy classes, when they approach this subject, are very telling. His moral philosophy would become known as Scottish common sense realism. And that is, that is a subject that's being revisited today uh, by theologians in our circles as to whether or not that is actually good or bad from a reform perspective. And the debate is still going on that. But, his, uh, but for a long time, Witherspoon's moral philosophy classes in general were embraced eagerly and considered to be the the, the, uh, the, the pinnacle of well-thought-out Reformed theology. In this particular case, though, some, some real issues start to come to the fore. He says, all men created are created with a moral compass which is to be developed through Bible instruction. Moral compass. The Bible doesn't talk in terms of that. There's some verses you might be able to come up with that would say much the same thing. He's made in the image of God. Uh, he, the law is planted in his heart. 
uh, things like that. But moral compass is something that sounds, uh, it, it, it's fuzzy in terms of its understanding. And he says that is to be added to, that's to be instructed from the Bible to strengthen that moral compass. And he goes on, he says, civil magistrates should and will pursue and develop moral judgment logically or even scientifically. There's common sense. You even hear from politicians today about common sense politics, right? What makes sense to everybody just naturally. That's the same thing that Witherspoon was appealing to. And he was saying that, that of course civil magistrates will want to improve the people. We're not, they're not dumbing people down, surely. Right? And, uh, and so, you know, that civil magistrates will and should pursue and develop this moral judgment. This moral compass is in your heart and it needs to be called out for civil obedience, for civil consideration and civil compassion. You become better people because of this moral compass that's, that's, uh, that's, in, that's put in your heart. And, and that means that, you know, we eventually have to talk about what morality is. And so he defines morality in terms of, guess what? Two things. He says there's a spiritual side to morality and there's a temporal side to morality. There's a spiritual side in the individual's relationship, obedience, and walk with Christ. And of course here he would say, he would evidence, bring evidence of salvation through the gospel. But there's a temporal morality as well, he says. And that shows up in social order and public structure following natural law, whatever that is. Natural law is a word that is kicked around a lot, and it is rarely defined. And so it's a kind of a category that's, that suits the speaker in whatever way he likes. But to use natural law is like going and hiding rather than defending yourself. Um, Public morality, he says, or civility, cannot be sustained without spiritual morality. You can't force morality on people. Uh, they have to, have, that, have to act on that moral compass. The Bible has to be taught. That comes from the church. And, of course, when, the, when you act upon that, that moral compass in the world, the civilization becomes more prosperous. We all become better people. Uh, and a spiritual morality, he says, must be taught by the church. You don't, you don't, go, to the, you don't go to school for that. You don't go to, to, uh, to the government for that. The government thrives on the spiritual training that you get from the Bible. And so, he, so he's, he's stringing out here some things with some real loose ends on it. In, uh, in his lectures on moral philosophy... He says, some men, by reason of mental powers and industry, are superior to others. Did that sink in yet? My moral compass is superior to that person's moral compass. My civility is superior to his civility. What is that? What is that? What is that? Racism, you know, we hear that word a lot. It means nothing when we hear it today. This is what it means. I am naturally superior to this person. I, I just have to accept that. Now, this is as early, you know, as, um, uh, as 1700s. And um, his name just slipped my mind. Um, Charles Darwin, his book isn't published for another 150 years. But as Charles Darwin would say, he said, I had to rush to the printer because somebody else would beat me too publishing my book. The idea of racism and of prejudice has been brewing all the way through this, this, this period of time, 150 years. It's, it's already on people's minds. They already think in terms of racial discrimination. Slavery only reinforces that, but slavery is not the definition of this. What is different in the United States 
is that black people are inferior, whether they're slaves or not. Black people are inferior to white people. Nowhere else does that ever show up. This is a prejudice that we've created whole cloth. And it comes from the, for the fact, of course, that we are well-developed, educated Europeans who have benefited from a Christian world and life view for generation after generation after generation. And now we are presented with these Africans who have had no upbringing whatsoever, who have had no exposure to the gospel whatsoever, who have, you know, who have been idolaters all their lives. It is just natural for us to assume we are superior. It just is reinforced by what we see. This form of racism demonstrates the, the way that evolutionary theory is already being combined with the theology of Scripture. He, uh, Witherspoon is already demonstrating that, probably in a sense that he doesn't even understand or appreciate what he's saying. Uh, it's incumbent, you know, and, and this, is the, this is the part that's very interesting. He says, some men by reason of mental powers and industry, obviously these black people are less mentally capable and they are inferior to us and it's incumbent upon us because we are superior to be humane in our treatment of them. So it justifies his own slaves because he's going to treat them well. I'm not going to be treating them poorly. I'm going to be treating them well. This is the, th this is the seed which will show up during the Civil War in southern ministers like Palmer and Thornwell who will say much the same thing. In 1756, oh, I'm, that's, we've talked, Montgomery, uh, Jamie Montgomery, remember him, the slave, escaped from his master. He ran away. Well, and we know how we handle that in, in America in the, in, uh, in the 1850s. You send out a posse and you get them and you drag them back and you beat them half to death. Montgomery was caught and tried. He was, he was charged and put into a court of law. Well, that's not American. We don't do that here, I'll tell you that. He was tried in Edinburgh. Now, Lord Bankton is his, is his defense attorney. He has a, a defense attorney, a slave, has a defense attorney. He says, Montgomery, being instructed in the Christian religion and baptized, entitled him to the rights and privileges of the king's other subjects. You remember how the, the government and the, the Church of Scotland emerged here. We're all committed to the same doctrine. We're all committed to the same understanding of reality. The prosecution reported of Witherspoon's clarification of this to Montgomery. He said, well, well, you know, Witherspoon did tell him that he doesn't think it changes anything. And yet, because of Witherspoon had given Montgomery a certificate of Christian conduct, he officiated something. He, he didn't give him a baptism. I guess it's the same thing as a baptism <laughs> certificate. He gave him a testimonial saying he's a, he's a decent man. He's a God-fearing man. And that there was an expectation, the, the, uh, the defense argued, that, uh, uh, that, he would be going, that he would be set free. This is, this, is, this, is, this is taking up a lot of court time and getting a lot of attention. Now, the slave owner, Montgomery, died before the case could be concluded. So Jamie Montgomery went away a free man before anything could be uh, decided. But then there was another one named David Spence. And in 1759, once he was baptized, he formally renounced his master's ownership of him in a very well-written statement. He says, I, David Spence, formerly called Black Tom, late slave to, David, to Dr. David Dalrymple of Lindifferin, hereby intimate to you that the said David Dalrymple, that being formerly a, a heathen slave to you and of consequence that then as your disposal but now being instructed in the Christian faith by the Reverend Mr. Harry Spence, minister of the gospel in Weymouth, 
and so being admitted to the church of Christ, established in this kingdom and of consequence, am now liberate and set at freedom from my old yoke, bondage and slavery, and by the laws of this Christian land, there is no vestige of slavery allowed. Well, he's overstepping. <laughs> slavery is, is rampant in Scotland right now. Nevertheless, you take it upon you to exercise your tyrannical will over me and would dispose of me arbitrarily at your despotic will and pleasure, and for that end you threaten to send me abroad out of this country to the West Indies and there dispose of me for money by which you subvert the ends and designs of Christian instruction which ransoms liberty to all its members. Sending me to West, the, the West Indies would have been a death sentence, and it was for even slaves who escaped in the United States. 1759, he renounced his, his uh, master's ownership. He was tried in court. Three lawyers gave Spence their assistance free of charge. This is starting to pick up steam. His declaration was given while being in support of a local farmer and a church elder. Spence was arrested, held in jail. Several churches raised funds for Spence as also many local lower class workers. And again, the slave owner died before the trial could be concluded, so he went free. Then came a third case. His name was Joseph Knight. 1774, this Jamaican slave sought freedom from his master, Sir John Wedderburn of Perthshire. The case brought biblical arguments from the lawyers. Now the trial is going through. Nobody's dying. Trial is going through. What are you saying about slavery and the Bible? Slavery and the Bible. The defense is arguing his case in the court of law from the Bible. A more determined examination of the meaning of the Old Testament passages referring to slavery, Paul's writings in the New Testament, you can think of the various places in Scripture where slavery is mentioned and whether it's condemned or whether it's approved. The lawyer for the prosecution, Robert Cullen, asserted that Christian baptism was irrelevant. He said this has nothing to do with the fact this is a temporal matter, not a spiritual one. I read John Witherspoon. This is a temporal matter. Slavery is slavery. He's owned lock, stock, and barrel. His soul can be as free as he wants, but he, well, he, is, he, belongs, to, he belongs to this man. A Alan uh, McConaughey, on behalf of the defense, claimed that the genius of the law of Scotland is adverse to slavery. The genius of the law of Scotland. There's that merging again with the confession of faith. The genius of God's word in practice is what he means by that. The genius of the law of, cotton, of Scotland is adverse to slavery. It is the spirit of the established religion of the country. <coughs> See the benefit that this is bringing? Pretty incredible, isn't it? As to Christianity, it is indisputable that slavery is inconsistent with the principles and spirit of it. Christ and His apostles did not arraign the injustice of slavery in direct terms, but as the very purpose of the gospel was to procure peace on earth and goodwill to men of every nation, tindred, tongue, and people, and as it required the practice of the purest morality in this world as an indispensable condition of obtaining happiness in the next, its doctrines sapped the very foundations of slavery so that whatever the one it was perfectly established, the other could not but fall. This court came to a decision. And the decision by the majority of the Court of Session judges, 8 to 4, was to allow Knight his freedom, ending the legal sanction of slavery in Scotland. The decision by a majority of court of session judges, eight to four, yeah, I said that. Lord Kames, one of the court judges, cast his vote with these words. We sit here to enforce right, not to enforce wrong. Although in, plant, in the plantations, another, another one of them said, although in the plantations they have laid hold of poor blacks, 
and made slaves of them, yet I do not think that is agreeable to humanity not to say to the Christian religion, not to say to the Christian religion, is a man a slave because he is black? See, there's that racism they're being confronted with. No, he is our brother, and he is a man, though not of our color. He is in a land of liberty with his wife and child. Let him remain there. One of the most uh, ama- uh, profound of, of um, uh, men who spoke on this issue was a guy named William Robertson. He was a pastor. And Alan McConaughey, in defense, cited Robertson in saying that there is no superiority in power, no pretext of, cons- of consent can justify the ignominious depression of human nature or can confer on one man the right of dominion over the person of another. It is not the authority of any single precept in the gospel, but the spirit and the genius of the Christian religion more powerfully laying a particular command which has abolished slavery throughout the world. Even though slavery has been part and parcel with every single civilization up to this point, we are seeing the back break and it is happening before the Civil War. While this is going on in Scotland, William Wilberforce is making headway in England. That's what we studied last year, you remember. And between the two, a very sound pronouncement of justice is overwhelming this whole thing, this whole issue. And it's doing so without going to war. The spirit and the genius of the Christian religion is what's allowed to prevail here. He goes on, he says that William Robertson goes on, he says, this was a somewhat optimistic judgment in light of the expansion of slavery and the slave trade. Everybody's, everybody in Scotland's bought into it. So we gotta, we're, we're, we're saying we're going to pull this back. And yet Robertson anticipated this by admitting to a continuing power of the institution of the colonies. He said, well, I know Virginia's not going to change easily. I know that the, the South is, is already full swing into this. They're not going to want to change anything. Which for him was an unchristian devotion to avarice. That was his judgment. And which he said must be charged upon the corruption of the heart not upon the religion that testifies against it. Robertson's influence was appreciated very much by William Wilberforce, and he corresponded with Robertson and helped to put, uh, put some of his words into his campaign against the slave trade uh, as he was doing in, in, uh, in London. Now, I, I talked about uh, Witherspoon's moral philosophy lectures There's another Scottish uh, professor named James Beattie, and he teaches moral philosophy at another college in Aberdeen. And his words are very uh, profound for us. Slavery is inconsistent with the dearest and most essential rights of man's nature, seeks to degrade those being endowed with rational souls and created for immorality, immortality, and in a word, it is utterly repugnant to every principle of religion, reason, conscience, and humanity. That a man, a rational and immoral and immortal being, should be treated on the same footing with a beast or a piece of wood and bought and sold subject to the will of another man, it is vain to talk any any longer of the eternal distinction between right and wrong, truth and falsehood, good and evil. James Stephen, a lawyer at St. Kitts, the the man down here at the bottom, uh, and later a member of parliament in England, Lead, is a leading abolitionist in Wilberforce's circle, and he's a drafter of the bill that will, that will finally succeed in abolishing slave trade in 1833. And he claims that Beattie's writings and lectures were very profoundly influential on him. So there's lots, there's, there's, there's a singular voice coming out. It's the Christian faith that's going to change the world in this regard. And, and, that's the, that, and that's what's coming out of, out of Scotland. Um, just uh, go quickly through an, a, f- a few more things here. Uh, the landmark case against Joseph Knight, that third one we talked about. In 1788, Scotland sends 
16 petitions. Actually, Parliament received 101 petitions. A petition in this regard is a we request humbly that you decide this in, our, in this direction. So it's a petition to take action, Parliament. And they received 101 uh, uh, petitions, and 16 of them were, came out of Scotland uh, about the slave trade. Um, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland that year received three of them. They, they, the, the church would cry out for a, 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 a change in, the, in, this, in the law, and that was sent on to Parliament. In 1788, the Marischal College and the Presbytery of Aberdeen petitioned Parliament toward abolition, and the General Assembly of the Church received three more overtures. Parliament received 16 out of 101 such petitions regarding the slave trade from Scotland, 11 of them from the presbyteries and synods of the Church of, of Scotland. So the church is very active in petitioning Parliament to make these changes. And in 1791, uh, the Wilberforce Bill again failed to pass Parliament, 163 to 88, but it is building steam. It is gathering uh, more and more um, motivation. Several Scots were working alongside Wilberforce in his Clapham Circle. That's what we talked about last year. 1792, Scotland, with 185 petitions, provided over one-third of the British and Irish total. 38 came from the church, petitioning Parliament. 118 petitions from concerned citizens that were held in church halls and were moderated, most likely, by pastors themselves. The church was very active in seeing this law changed. And in 1807, Parliament finally passed Wilberforce's abolition of slave trade. So it was a lot of influence from the Scottish church. Which, of course, brings up big questions for us. Could that actually have happened here? And the answer is no. For positive reasons, perhaps, as well as negative ones. Uh, the differences between Scotland and the United States during this period of time were stark. Uh, the church in, in Scotland, the church-state relationship in Scotland was very close. The Church of Scotland was Presbyterian. It was, the, it was a government church. They worked together hand in hand. But in 18th, 19th century United States, the church-state relationship was separate. We are separate. Now, it wasn't because they were afraid so much of Presbyterians. It's because they didn't, they didn't want Roman Catholics to take over. The same fear that had been in England for so long carried over into, into the colonies. We don't want any church meddling with us in government. And uh, so the Jeffersonian uh, principle, planting the flag, uh, gained, uh, gained notoriety. So that influence was very different in these, in these periods. The common moral ground was biblical. The church could appeal to Parliament on biblical grounds. And already in the United States, Congress is saying, who are you? What, what, are, you, what are you giving me this for? What's, we, we, sure, I respect the Bible, but I'm not going to argue before, co before Congress with the, with the Bible. It, the worldview was just com continually very different. The common moral ground was biblical. There was no common moral ground. There was civility. The Enlightenment is what really drove 18th and 19th century America. And we, we are civil. We are encouraging one another. Everybody's got our moral compass, and we're all advancing in the same direction. Ben Franklin all over, you know, we just say the same thing. Speaking to the state, in, back in Scotland, speaking to the state of moral issues was understood as the responsibility and the prerogative of the church in the United States, the church, Christians, should stay out of political affairs. Just, just go home. Let us handle this. It goes on. Uh, Scotland was fairly united, uh, had a fairly united front theologically on the issue of slavery. But in, in the United States, increasingly was increasingly divided theologically. And we're going to see that next week, Lord willing. The theology divide begins to destroy the churches uh, as, as the nation begins to pull apart and polarize. The influence of the church in Scotland was very impactful. 
but the church, even though everybody went to church, did not have the same power, did not have the same punch, did not have the same influence. And the result in Scotland was a very successful movement by the government to abolish slavery, something that was historically unprecedented. Nobody ever thought about abolishing slavery. Civilizations ran on slavery. Every civilization before that was, had to have slaves. Nobody would abolish slavery. That's just stupid. But Scotland was one of the first. But in the United States, no, we go to war. And we'll leave it there. <laughs> Next week, we come back to the United States and we find out what's brewing during much the same kind of period of time. Any questions or comments? Yes, yes, yes. He mentioned Philemon, the book of Philemon and, and Paul's writing about care and, and gentleness, respect for a Christian slave. Um, yeah, I, we, we're going we're gonna to see how the Bible is, is proof text on both sides. Yeah. I was, I was also going to add, did anybody argue from the standpoint, um, and uh, the slave did connect to this, too, especially in America, of, um, the slavery in Egypt, which was very similar to, to what happened. And it would, 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 they, would, they ar- would anybody argue from that and say, last time, <laughs> well, you're ahead of us, jo- Joseph. <laughs> Tune in. Tune in. How many people were actually slaves in Scotland? Like I said, there were very few because it was mostly a logistical matter. Uh, you, you would, your, your dad, you grow, you, Nancy, you're growing up in your daddy's house and you, you want for nothing. And you know your daddy works, but you don't know what he does. And he never brings home his products. You never see him go down to the docks and, and, and haggle with, with, with sailors. But he is heavily invested in the, in the slave trade. And you never see that. You only enjoy what you have. So, you know, like I said, there were, uh, there were probably only 100 slaves physically in Scotland at this, at this period of time. Yeah. Someone who had led his yeah. Yeah, that was common. That was common. Would you have a question about that, David, or clarification? Okay. Was the kind of happened here in the United States? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Was the kind of slavery practice in Scotland cradle to grave generational slavery? Their children were also slaves. And their children's children were also slaves. Well, I'm going to be talking about the evolution of slavery next time, I think. Yeah. It's going to come up. Because it gets really in, in the early periods of, slave, of the slave trade, there was no, um, there was only work till you die. Uh, and, but that would only, de- you know, that would develop later to perpetuating your right. slaves and keeping them alive and doing that kind of thing. In the, the earliest days of the slavery we're talking about were, were, the, were the cruelest. Does that answer? I, I forget what you no, brought up. No, that makes sense because yeah. they're working them in the mines. Yeah, you, you uh, well, you, you, no matter where you sent them, it was cheaper because, because the Middle Passage was so profitable. It was, you, you just work them until they die, you go buy another one. Everything is economics here. Everything is the bottom, you know, the bottom line is, is money. And they just perpetuate, well, they say, well, I, well, at least I don't work until they die here. They live with me, so I guess it's fine if their children become slaves and on and on and on. I, I don't know how it works. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate your, your attention and, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to
pick it up here when we get, uh, when we get back next week.